Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. If you've been following my show, you know I like really interesting uh, companies that have got fascinating technologies, and I want to introduce you to one uh, today. Our, our guest is Dr. Rahul uh, Kushwa, who uh, has got a company called Predict Medics, and what they've got is a, uh, a company that uh, uses uh, AI, uh, non-invasive AI health scanner that detects cannabis and alcohol impairment and other diseases in less than 30 seconds. Unbelievable. Uh, Predict, Med Predict Medics, Inc. is an emerging provider of rapid health screening, medical devices, and remote patient care solutions globally. They're safe entry stations powered by a proprietary artificial intelligence uh, use multi-spectral cameras to analyze psychological data patterns and identify highly accurate screening technology to detect conditions such as cannabis, alcohol impairment, infectious diseases, mental illnesses, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, as well as vital, vital psychological parameters, respiratory illnesses, COVID-19, and signs of fatigue. This sounds like the tricorder from Star Trek. This is awesome. Like, this is just fantastic. Dr. Rahul Kushwa, welcome to the show, sir. Well, thank you for having me on the show. And you know what you rightly said? So what we have basically done is we have brought that future to the present. And when you look at our technology, um, it looks like a metal screener that you may see at an airport, but it's not identifying if you're carrying pieces of metals. Instead, the moment you come and stand in front of it, it's going to tell you with a very high precision things like your heart rate, your breathing rate, uh, your temperature, are you fatigued? Are you showing symptoms of infectious disease like cough, congestion, sweat cell activation? Are you showing signs of cannabis or alcohol impairment? And uh, at the same time, we have uh, done that third party independent clinical validation in different, different parts of the world. And uh, quite frankly, this is the only technology of its kind. Fantastic. Tell me a little bit about, uh, about uh, the company. Uh, is this the only product that you've got, the only technology you've got, or have been around for a while? So we have been working on this for a bit over uh, four years. Um, I actually come from the academic world. Um, I was a scientist with the National Research Council of Canada and a professor at the University of Ottawa. And then I made the switch to entrepreneurship because what I saw was that there were all these great developments happening on the AI and data science front, which were not really being brought into medicine to solve actual problems. And that was the birth of Predict Medics. For us, the mantra from day one was, Let's look at all the developments that have happened in AI, machine learning, deep learning, and how can we use these to solve real problems that are plaguing the world? The biggest one is, of course, what's going on in healthcare, no matter which part of the world you're in. Um, look at our healthcare system. You go into a hospital and uh, you got to go through a triage nurse. They got to put all these medical devices on you to measure your vitals, your parameters, and that takes up uh, 40 minutes to an hour. We have a technology that basically speeds that up to 10 seconds in real time. And, and what is it? What is it? Is it taking your blood pressure? Is it taking your blood? Is it taking you? What, like, what is it? What is it? Uh, it's, it's, it's not touching you. It's not taking a biological sample. Basically, you're standing in front of the technology for 10 seconds. And within 10 seconds, just like Star Trek, on a screen, it's going to identify your temperature. It's going to identify your uh, breathing rate, it's going to identify your heart rate, presence of symptoms, and uh, we are just about to uh, roll out blood pressure detection as well. Imagine without a need for a cuff, you stand in front of one of these units, and it's going to tell your blood pressure too. And how does it, uh, with all this information that is not actually uh, invasive, how is it actually determining all these potential uh, disease states? So when you look at these units, these units have uh, multispectral cameras and multispectral cameras are basically looking at skin deep in terms of uh, how is your blood flowing on your face. And our secret sauce or our IP is more about how do you take those subtle changes in blood flow that are happening in micro to milliseconds and how do you convert them into individual symptoms, signs of disease, signs of impairment or signs of fatigue? And that's where uh, we just got our um, U.S. patent granted, uh, where we're using AI to identify both cannabis and alcohol impairment. And based on my understanding, this is perhaps the uh, the only patent of its kind which has been granted to date. So this is uh, with cameras determining blood flow and with changes in blood flow determining whether you're impaired uh, with alcohol or cannabis. So subtle changes in uh, blood, blood flow, um, subtle changes over short span time 
that is what's being correlated to individual symptoms. And that's where uh, one of the recent announcements we had was uh, we were also launching more of a, um, a, a mini version of our technology where you can take like a small multi-spectral camera, hook it to your phone, and that camera can scan you. And all of a sudden that can identify if you're showing signs of impairment or not. And that well, is something get, which law enforcement can really use. If you get it attached to the telephone, no question. So I was aware of a company that had a, uh, a camera that was taking pictures of pupils. And they were saying that uh, the way that the pupil would, uh, would follow a moving dot could determine alcohol impairment or cannabis or Alzheimer's or dementia or something like that. Um, I, uh, I was, I, another company that I was following uh, was uh, taking a test of saliva. And based on the test of saliva, they thought they could determine concussion, Alzheimer's, uh, cannabis, et cetera. Um, the, the, the pictures of the, the pupils weren't invasive, but it was, it was the pupils and, and, the, and the eyes and the, and the moving of the eyes that they had described as uh, the eyes being the, the, the sort of the vision on the brain and what was happening in the brain. The, uh, the, the saliva wasn't really invasive, but it was, you know, you know like a blood test actually taking part of, uh, of, of your body, the saliva. You're doing this with just cameras of your skin. Is that correct? Again, so the multispectral cameras have been around for a while. Basically, they're taking your pictures in different wavelengths. And we have identified basically a new application for these cameras. And uh, as I said, the secret sauce is about how you convert those subtle changes that you see on the face to actual symptoms. Changes on the face? Yep. So it's not in the rest of the body. It's just the face. Mm -hmm. That's right. How, how does the face change? It's the underlying blood flow pattern, right? So blood flow in different parts of your face. So just to give you an, an example, so let's say when you're screening for presence of headaches, when you have a migraine or you have any other form of headache, there is actually a distinct change in blood flow that happens on your frontal region. Now, we have been able to collect a lot of clinical data back in the day that we were able to use to train our algorithms and reach a very high levels of accuracy in terms of identifying headaches, for instance. Really? So headaches, Alzheimer's, cannabis, alcohol uh, uh, impairment all shows up mm -hmm. on the way that your blood flows through your face. And, and so I guess, you know, whether you're flushed or, uh, or red in the face or something like that, that's amazing. Well, again, and that's where I said, so uh, as far as our IP goes, we have been able to identify some very unique features. And the IP is really about the entire process in terms of when you bring in this multispectral data, what points you look at, what are the feature engineering that you have to do to extract those features to make a decision if someone is impaired or not. Unbelievable. This is really, this really is Star Trek uh, tricorders. Fascinating. We're going to take a break for messages and come back uh, with Dr. Rahul Kashwa in, uh, in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saginaw and 60. I'm having a really interesting conversation with Dr. Rahul uh, Kashwa. Uh, he's um, got this company and this product, this technology that sounds like uh, space uh, Star Trek's uh, a tricorder. That uh, it, it has cameras that take pictures of your face, and uh, based on the blood flow underneath the skin in your face, can determine whether you've got Alzheimer's or dementia or a headache. Uh, or the two that they've just got uh, approved in their uh, in their patents from the U.S. Uh, patent office is uh, um, alcohol uh, impairment or cannabis impairment. Absolutely fascinating. I just never realized, never believed, never thought that you could have this uh, all show up on your face. Um, uh, this gentleman, uh, Dr. Kashwa, has got you know pretty impressive background. Uh, he's got a uh, Bachelor of Science from the University of Toronto. He's uh, worked in entrepreneurship and business development at the Mars Discovery District, University of Toronto. Uh, he's uh, got a negotiation. He's got a diploma in negotiations and project management from something called ESI. And then he's got a PhD in laboratory medicine and pathobiology, whatever pathobiology is. You're going to have to explain that to me uh, from uh, the University of uh, Toronto. Uh, and uh, he's got an interesting background. He's uh, uh, been um, uh, the, uh, the co-founder of a company that's got T, DNA T. You don't have to tell what DNA uh, T is to me. It sounds kind of interesting. Uh, he's been a professor at the University of uh, Ottawa. He's been a scientist and a research officer at the National Research Council of Canada. Uh, he's been a project co-lead and consulting scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children. He's uh, been a postdoctoral scientist at Stem Cell and Cancer Research Center. And he's now the founder 
and uh, and chief operating officer of Predict Medrix, uh, in Predict Medics Inc., which is this company that's developed this uh, technology, uh, artificial intelligence company developing artificial technology driven solutions for impairment and healthcare. Uh, um, absolutely fascinating. How did you like come up with this idea? Was this like one of these in the shower brilliant uh, you know light bulbs that went on, or like how did you come up with this idea? Well, again, kind of, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, when you climb up that academic ladder, it's like uh, the ultimate end result is becoming a professor, right? Being in academia or running your own labs. So when I was at, at National Research Council and University of Ottawa, um, I was actually heading a few immunology labs, and the focus was on human immunology. We were working a lot with industry partners, but one of the things that I personally realized was that when it comes to academia, just the way how things are, people like to work in their own little silos, where it's like, I'm going to be focusing on this because we can get grants for this specific project. And it's not so much about that, you know what, let's go out there, let's try to do something that addresses an unmet need. And that's where I said I was uh, following up and reading up on a lot. I mean, a lot of things that pertain to data science, AI, the developments in healthcare. And I actually saw a huge void that on one hand, you have these doctor scientists that are focused on healthcare, but again, working in these little silos, um, addressing certain very narrow problems. And on the other end, you have these data scientists coming up with these great algorithms which can do a lot of great stuff, but what we are what they are lacking is the understanding of medicine, understanding of human biology. So what if we try to bring this together? And that was the birthplace of Predict Medic. So it was not just about using AI to solve a problem because it's cool. It was about using AI and leveraging it to solve a problem that addresses a global need. And that's where our technology comes in. Um, the applications are in healthcare, I mean, all over the world, quite frankly. And the other one is fit for duty screening. You look at North America, um, a lot of workplaces have actually mandated some form of fit for duty screening. But what do they have right now? Okay, uh, once in a while, they're going to take out an alcohol breathalyzer, or at times, they're going to have a supervisor monitoring the entire facility just to see if someone is looking fatigued, someone is looking sick, or someone is looking impaired. Quite frankly, that's all they got. And that's where our solution comes in. Fully autonomous, unbiased, 10 seconds to scan every individual. So quite frankly, every person that's coming into the facility can be scanned in real time to identify if they're fit for work or not. And that includes, of course, impairment. Uh, that includes signs of infectious disease, and that includes fatigue. Brian, I think you're on mute. Sorry. You got to tell me, how do you think that you can determine with a camera uh, pointed at your face what the difference is between someone that's impaired with alcohol versus someone that's impaired with cannabis? It really boils down to the level of feature engineering. And we have identified some unique features that have a correlation with alcohol and certain features that have a correlation with cannabis. Now, one of the questions we do get a lot of time is that what about other drugs? What about opioids? And quite frankly, we haven't gone there because with any AI algorithm, if you really want it to have a high level of accuracy, you need those data points. You need the clinical data to feed the AI algorithms for them to become smarter. And we don't have access to those data points when it comes to opioids or other drugs. And that's where our focus was about alcohol and cannabis. And that is what we have achieved. Okay. And, and, and so what you're saying is that there's enough of a difference in the way the blood flows below the skin between those two that you can actually have a marker that is somehow different between the two. And you're saying yes. the same thing for different disease states like uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, et cetera, and psychological problems as well? So with dementia, Alzheimer's, I mean, that is something which is still being developed right now. That solution has not been fully developed. And yes, that is exactly what we are finding. So there, we are applying two components to it. One is, of course, analysis of your face using multispectral cameras to look at the underlying blood flow patterns. And the other component is speech analysis as well. So there, uh, we're going to ask the individual to, uh, let's say, look at the multispectral camera and repeat a sentence for a few seconds. Okay, so person's looking at the camera. Uh, you say you can do it in 10 seconds. And uh, and you've got AI, so I presume as you get more and more uh, data points, the, the 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 machine gets better. Um, mm -hmm. 
But uh, is this good at determining you from a baseline versus you uh, impaired, or is it good for the whole population such that you can just check one person and say, no, they're cannabis impaired. Let me give you the example. I, I told you about this company that was developing the, the technology for the eye. What they found is that uh, the pupil movements were a bell curve uh, within uh, within the population and uh, really fit people and really uh, you know good athletes were at one end of the bell curve and people that were uh, obese out of, out of, uh, out of uh, overweight and out of fitness were the other end of, of a potential bell curve such that really the right way to determine someone uh, was to evaluate them versus their own personal baseline mm -hmm. um, versus the average population. So do you have to determine your face versus a baseline of when you weren't impaired? Or can you actually do that versus the average population without knowing what a person's baseline was? So we can actually do it without identifying that baseline. And I'll give you um, more of the example that we dealt with. So uh, one of the uh, vitals we were looking at was actually the heart rate. And with the accuracy levels, for instance, what we found was that when you're looking at people who were below the age of 18, the accuracy was not as high. So basically, we had to do an adjustment for people who were below a certain age. And that's where now one of the features we have been able to roll out is age estimation. Because using age estimation, it can actually make a correction for that variation that you see with certain individuals. And that, at the, the end of the day, increases the accuracy of identifying a parameter. Okay, but 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 for an example, you know, we've always heard about people that are uh, are larger can take more alcohol versus people that are thinner that can take less alcohol. Do you have to also, uh, um, you know, adjust for weight, for size, for uh, for fitness levels, things like that? Not at all, because again, the decision point is not based on a single factor. The decision point is uh, the decision is actually based on multiple factors and how they weigh together in terms of identifying a probability of the person being impaired. If we were only analyzing a single factor and basing a decision on it, then yes, you're absolutely right. That's what we would need to do. Okay, so tell me where you are. You, you say you've gotten a US patent for, uh, for uh, alcohol dependence, uh, alcohol impairment and cannabis impairment. Uh, those are the first two that you've got. Um, and you've designed these, these machines uh, and you're actually looking at designing a new machine that can attach to uh, to a telephone, um, are you like are you going to start producing them? Or are you going to be contracting out manufacturing? Tell me about sort of the the ramp up of the company. So again, I mean, over the past two years, we have had successful deployments in different parts of the world. Uh, we were at the Super Bowl in Tampa Bay a few years ago. We were at the Formula One, and we got some great press coverage. I mean, we actually got some coverage of from Fox News whereby uh, the reporter was there, and guess what? This person walks in. They didn't know they have COVID nineteen. But our technology was able to identify they did. And then they underwent a COVID-19 test and boom, <laughs> they had COVID-19. So but Fox, the last Fox, two News, years, Fox News doesn't believe in COVID-19. I know. <laughs> well, that's a different story. It's a different conversation altogether. Uh, <laughs> but over the past two years, uh, what we have really done is to have these actual customer deployments. I mean, we had our units out there in the Calgary Tower, uh, a, a lot of buildings there in Alberta. Uh, we had our deployments with flow water and it was more about because when you're talking about an actual customer deployment at a customer site, there are certain nuances that come into play, which you don't always encounter in the clinical setting. So uh, the last two years have been about perfecting those nuances. And now we are at a stage where we are moving forward with that full scale commercialization. And uh, recently uh, we announced a half a million dollar contract in the defense segment. At the same time, we have established a framework of distributors, and now we are moving full steam ahead with commercialization of our solution. And just to give you another example, uh, with the clinical validation that has been done, it was done in different parts of the world, countries like India, Indonesia. And now uh, the, the hospitals and the universities where this independent validation was done, they have become cheerleaders for our technology. But just a few days ago, um, again, somebody sent this to us. We actually had an article in a major newspaper in, in Indonesia, and we have... Uh, no part in terms of getting that article out there because they found out about our technology through the university, through the hospital, and they wrote an article on the technology. So now this university in Indonesia is working towards pushing the technology into healthcare, into the government segment, and uh, we have the same effect, which is taking place in India. And those two markets together, you're talking about billions of people, trillions of dollars in economic activity, and um, thousands and thousands of hospitals, and clearly lots and lots of workplaces. And coming back to uh, North America, 
here we are putting together the distributor uh, network and framework that we need to get the technology out there because it's not just about giving the technology to the end user, it's also about the support that they need in place to make sure it can integrate with the hospital setting or the workplace and so on and so forth. So do you need uh, FDA or Health Canada approvals? Do you need to do clinical trials with thousands of people? Like, tell me what your approval process is other than just to get in the patent. So as a screening technology, no, you actually do not need to uh, get this approved by FDA or Health Canada because when you talk about a fit for duty screen, it's first step screening process. So it's screening individuals. But at the same time, we do have an opportunity to convert this into a completely uh, a triage solution for healthcare for hospitals, and that's where certifications come into place. But when you look at the Asian markets, the um, the hospitals and universities that we are working with, they are the ones taking it to the government, and we are moving forward with the process to get the certified as a medical device. Now, talking about Indonesia, once you get the certified as a medical device in Indonesia for healthcare as a triage solution, by default you can roll it across uh, eleven countries in Asia, and those countries together. It's, uh, I believe, over uh, 14 or $15 trillion of economic activity. So um, that, that's one part of it. But the other part, as a fit-for-duty screen, it does not need certification from FDA. So for a fit-for-duty screen, you don't need certification. No. But if you used it to, to diagnose a disease state in, exactly. in a healthcare setting, you would. Is that correct? That's right. Absolutely. Uh, but you know, if you if you go to Asia and you get this uh, product rolled out to, with your AI and all the data, you're going to just get smarter. And uh, you're going to exactly. become even better at your diagnosis. That's right. Unbelievable. What interesting. You're a Canadian company? Yes, we are. Based are out of public? Toronto. Are you public? Are you private? Can I buy a share? Yes, we are public. We are trading on the CSC here. Uh, the symbol is PMED. And we are also trading in the US. And the symbol is PMEDF. And we are also trading on Frankfurt. And uh, we are a fully reporting issuer with the SEC in the US. Awesome. What's your market cap? Our market cap is uh, around 15 to 18 million right now. 15, 18 million US or Canadian? Uh, Canadian. Okay, excellent. Um, and uh, what do you think about your opportunities to raise capital and grow? So, uh, so again, if you look at the market right now, if we were to look at the comps, there are several AI companies out there which are public, or several companies that are trying to develop technologies for uh, cannabis impairment, so on and so forth. And they are trading at valuations that are many times higher compared to what we are trading at. Yeah. And a lot of these companies are not even close to commercializing their solution, but we are actually commercializing and have announced POs and we have a sales pipeline, which is pretty significant. So um, uh, that's where we do see that there is going to be that uptrend that we're going to see in the market. And, um, and yeah, <laughs> so for us, it's more about having this turn into a fundamental play where it's not just about a technology, it's about a technology that works, which has been validated, and a technology which has been commercialized. How many uh, units have you actually sold? So our last announcement that we had, um, that was for, I believe, uh, five units, but it's a three-year contract. So our business model uh, is analogous to a SaaS model, um, where it's about a monthly lease that you pay per unit, and that gives us some great margins like a software company. So what's the cost of uh, one of these units that uh, that you uh, use as a scanner for the 10 seconds of picture taking? So what I would say is, uh, again, because I don't know who's going to be listening to the segment, it could be a potential customer. So I don't want to say exact numbers in terms of what it costs us. But what I'll say is the margins are similar to what you would see with software companies with our leasing model. Okay. Are we talking 10,000 or 100,000 or a million? Uh, you mean in terms of? Uh, the cost of one of these machines. Oh, thousands. Thousands of dollars. Yeah. So less less than ten thousand. <laughs> Around there. Okay. And you're yeah. going to rent it to you're going to rent it to people on a monthly basis. That's right. Um, and and what's the rent going to be on a monthly basis? And is it going to be on a monthly basis or a per user basis? No, it's uh, it's a monthly basis. Um, and again, so it depends. So let's say if they only want the solution to look at the vitals, it's a different rate. But they if they want the entire solution that looks at all the different components, and that's five thousand dollars a month. And do you, five thousand dollars a month, but the unit only costs ten thousand bucks. Your payback is two months. What a well, at the same time, you got to remember there's all the processing that comes into play, right? Oh, um, yeah. And at the same time, I mean, when you talk about the AI algorithms, there has to be that regular communication taking place. So the algorithms are getting smarter, and all the upgrades are being given to you at the same time. So it's not like after six months, oh, now you got to 
get a different license for our next version of the software. That's all included. Who owns the data? You do or the uh, the customer owns the data? The customer owns the data. Oh, come on. Yeah, you've got to open the, own the data so you can plug it into your uh, AI uh, machine learning uh, technique and, and learn from it. So you've got to own we, it. We only do that from the clinical sites where we are collecting clinical data, not from customers for obvious reasons. So the customers can keep all the data of, of whether people have got the cannabis or the alcohol or the whatever it is. That's interesting. That's um, right. Because you know, a lot of these other companies that I mentioned, uh, they would they would own the data such they can create this huge data um, uh, you know, base uh, that uh, then it accesses all of the, the, the new learning that one gets from all of these new patients that are going to be exposed to the to the unit. That's interesting. Um, OK, so if I want to check you out, maybe, uh, you know, buy a stock or uh, or uh, check out your uh, your financial statements or maybe uh, try to buy one of your units. How do I do that? Have you got a website I should go to? Yes, it's predictmedics.com. Awesome. Well, let's uh, check back in in a little while and see uh, you know how your progress is because it sounds like just a fascinating technology and an interesting company. And if you're only 10 to 50 million ducks in uh, in market cap, uh, I think that you're undervalued and it could be a really op- interesting opportunity to follow a Canadian technology story and see how you do. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for your time and thanks for having me on the show. We're going to take a break uh, and be back in just two minutes with another interesting story. Stay with us, everybody.